Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, this uh, Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming uh, hearing. Uh, while the clock may be winding down on the Bush administration's time in office, its regulatory damage is unfortunately far from over. The administration is currently working on finalizing a number of last-minute rule changes that, if enacted, will have serious negative impacts on our environment long after this administration has left office. Those proposed midnight rules are so numerous and far-reaching that they would harm everything from the quality of our air and water to our public lands to the survival of endangered species and our warming climate. Indeed, the Bush administration is, uh, is on pace to do almost as much damage to our environment in its last eight weeks in office as it did over the last eight years. The administration has set its regulatory sights on two of our nation's longest standing and most important environmental laws. The Environmental Protection Agency is attempting to push through multiple rules that will severely weaken clean air requirements for industry, degrading air quality for all Americans, and worsening our climate crisis. Meanwhile, the Department of Interior is seeking to gut the Endangered Species Act by removing scientific input, weakening protections for iconic species like the polar bear and preventing consideration of the impacts of global warming. The administration is seeking to make these sweeping changes uh, to the Endangered Species Act while minimizing public input and review. Recently, the Bush administration rushed through consideration of 300,000 comments on the proposed rule in 32 hours, and then provided a mere 10 days for the public to review the environmental assessment of the changes. The administration is also pushing to ease restrictions on some of the most destructive practices for our climate. The Interior Department is in the process of issuing rules that will remove key protections against mountaintop removal, mining, and allow the development of oil shale in two million acres of western public lands. With so much work to be done on the economy, energy, and health care, it's unfortunate that President-elect Obama and the Democratic Congress will have to expend so much time recovering from the regulatory nightmare of these midnight rulemakings. Sadly, these rule changes are not a deviation from the Bush administration record. They are the culmination of eight years of industry handouts and environmental deregulation. By ramming through these 11th hour regulations, President Bush will simply cement his legacy as the most anti-environmental president in our nation's history. Today, the Select Committee has convened an oversight hearing with a panel of environmental and regulatory experts to further examine some of the most egregious of those last-minute rule changes. It is imperative that the Bush administration not be allowed to finalize these rules under the cover of darkness without public scrutiny. It's amazing what casting a little sunlight on these midnight regulations can do. Late yesterday afternoon, the EPA announced that it would drop its attempt to issue a regulatory loophole that would have allowed dirty power plants to produce even more air pollution and heat trapping emissions, which had been uh, uh, that which had been recommended uh, by the Cheney Secret Energy Task Force. This reversal prevented a rule change that would have increased global warming pollution by the equivalent of adding 50 million cars to the roads. In addition, the EPA subsequently confirmed reports that it would also abandon its push to roll back regulations on air pollution in our national parks and wilderness areas. The committee in this Congress will continue to keep a watchful eye on the Bush administration's regulatory actions until they have turned off the lights at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue once and for all. Now let me turn and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for an opening statement. Uh, because I think that it is important for the uh, nation to understand what is actually uh, taking place uh, as the Bush administ administration uh, winds down. Uh, they are also winding up their uh, uh, efforts uh, to uh, do further damage uh, to uh, the U.S. environment. And 
uh, I would hope that through this hearing uh, and testimony from our uh, witnesses uh, that we will be able to alert uh, not only uh, our colleagues here in, in uh, Congress, uh, but the people around this nation who are concerned that their children and their children's children uh, uh, might not have the uh, opportunity to live uh, in a, an environment that is conducive for human habitation uh, if these uh, moves by the administration continues. Uh, the administration uh, of uh, Barack Obama to come in is hiring and uh, bringing in new staff, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, we are going to have to look at this bold and reckless action that is taking place uh, right now around uh, irresponsible rulemaking. So I look forward, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, having uh, the opportunity to become dialogical with our witnesses and uh, to sound uh, the alarm uh, to the American public. I yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for holding this important hearing, and thank you to our, our witnesses today for being here, um, especially my fellow New Yorker, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, ple pleased that we're holding this hearing today to call attention to these several so-called midnight rules affecting the environment that the outgoing administration has proposed. They apply to a very te technical subject matter that is often overlooked by the media, particularly in the wake of all the press coverage associated with the incoming administration. But if allowed to stand, these rules could have very serious long-term effects on human health, the environment, and Congress has a responsibility to co conduct appropriate oversight of these actions. Take, for example, just three of the regulations under consideration here today. First, if allowed to be implemented, the administration's rule changing the Section 7 consultation process under the Endangered Species Act could have far-reaching implications for how the federal government protects endangered species. Section 7 of the ESA requires federal agencies to consult with the Fish and Wildlife Service and or the National Marine Fisheries Service when either of the two services determines that a federal agency's action could impact a threatened or endangered species. The purpose of that consultation is to seek solutions to mitigate any harmful effects on wildlife. The proposed final rule awaiting action at OMB would reverse this process, instead allowing federal agencies the discretion, their own discretion as to whether they need to consult with the services. The effect of this rule would be to take away the decision-making authority from trained biologists and instead place it in the hands of political appointees in the bureaucracy. It is yet another attempt to politicize decisions that should be based purely on sound science. The administration also proposes weakening the Clean Air Act with respect to pollution in the national parks. EPA currently measures air pollution in the national parks based on a three-hour and 24-hour uh, increment. A proposed final rule awaiting uh, action at OMB would change the measurement metric to annual pollution averages thus allowing for significant spikes in pollution during the peak summer months. The practical effect of this rule change is to make the air dirtier in our national parks, expose visitors to all the negative health effects ranging from asthma to heart disease uh, and others that are associated with air pollution. The administration is also using a tortured interpretation of Section 4D of the Endangered Species Act to avoid issuing regulations to protect polar bears recently listed as threatened under the Act. Section 4D requires that the Secretary issue regulations to protect threatened species, but in the regulation, regulations issued and awaiting final approval, the Secretary effectively exempts oil and gas companies and their activities from having to develop plans to protect polar bears and to mitigate impacts on their habitat. It also limits the applicability of consideration of climate change with respect to the polar bear listing, despite overwhelming evidence that climate change is responsible for habitat loss. These are just three examples of midnight regulations pending at OMB that will affect the environment, human health, and wildlife. And the hearing today uh, will touch on many more, unfortunately. Uh, it is imperative that we examine these uh, so that the House can take whatever action is necessary to reverse them or change them so they reflect the intent of Congress when it passed the statutes originally. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward uh, to the testimony of our witnesses, and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, uh, Mr. Inslee. 
Thank you. Uh, I just I want to thank our witnesses, all of whom who've been doing uh, great service uh, for the country and the environment during the long darkness, environmental darkness of the Bush administration. I want to thank you for keeping uh, hope alive during that long eight years. Uh, I do want to express disappointment, if not shock, that this administration is going out the way they have governed, which is with great arrogance towards the public and great indifference to the species they have a responsibility to protect. And I want to thank the chair for holding this hearing because what I would look at this is just sort of a final capping of the environmental nightmare of the Bush administration and the beginning of our effort to restore integrity to the law and to our environmental programs in this country. And I think we should use this as a springboard to be back here January 6th to really redouble our efforts to following the law. Thank you. Great. Uh, time has expired. Now we'll turn to our uh, witnesses. Uh, and our first witness today is uh, Mr. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr., who is president of the Waterkeeper Alliance. Mr. Kennedy is one of our nation's foremost champions uh, for clean water and clean air who has led the fight to restore the Hudson River and protect New York City's water supply. For his environmental leadership, Mr. Kennedy was named one of, the, one of Time Magazine's heroes of the planet. He is a tireless advocate, a prolific author, and a living environmental legend. We welcome you, uh, Mr. Kennedy, whenever you are ready. Please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start um, just by expressing my gratitude to the Capitol Police for some incredible detective work this morning, of recovering my suitcase, my briefcase from the taxi cab that took off when I went to check whether the Capitol door was open. I think it involved looking at some tapes and enlarging license plate, but they, they did get my testimony back to me almost well, only moments ago, and they were incredibly nice. So, um, and I also want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this issue, as well as my friend, Congressman Jay Inslee, my Congressman John Hall, and Congressman Cleaver, for all of whom have demonstrated extraordinary leadership on this issue. Um, we've been fighting a rear guard action over the past eight years. We had the finest environmental laws in this country, in the world, in this country, that we passed 28 major environmental laws that we passed after Earth Day 1970. Um, this, the last eight years, uh, if you look at, uh, this is the, as you pointed out, um, this is the worst environmental administration that we've ever had in American history, bar none. Um, if you look at NRDC's website, you'll see over 400 major environmental rollbacks that have been promoted or implemented by this White House over the past eight years as part of a deliberate concerted effort to eviscerate 30 years of environmental law. It's been a stealth attack. The White House has used all kinds of ingenious machinations to conceal this radical agenda from the American people, including Orwellian rhetoric. When they wanted to destroy the forest, they called it the Healthy Forest Act. When they wanted to destroy the air, they called it the Clear Skies Bill. Most insidiously, they put polluters in charge of virtually all the agencies of government that are supposed to be protecting Americans from pollution. The head of the Forest Service, they put in a timber industry lobbyist, Mark Ray, probably the most rapacious in history. As head of public lands, a mining industry lobbyist, Stephen J. Griles, is now serving a 10-month jail sentence. But Mr. Griles, for 20 years, has been saying that he believed that public lands are unconstitutional. And they put him in charge of public lands. The head of the Air Division, Mr. Homestead, who's sitting to my left, um, who's been a, uh, during virtually all of his career, uh, a, a, a attorney for the worst polluters in this country, particularly utility air polluters, um, as second in command of EPA, a Monsanto lobbyist, as head of Superfund, a woman whose last job was teaching corporate polluters how to evade Superfund. President's chief environmental advisor, Philip Cooney, the, the head of Council on Environmental Quality, was a, a lobbyist for the American Petroleum Institute. And in addition to that, these people very cleverly and very ingeniously over the past five years to keep, because the American public supports these laws, as you know, um, but they have deviously and ingeniously used riders, um, used uh, all kinds of, uh, of, of alterations in guidance and interpretations 
and then backdoor regulatory um, uh, uh, um, uh, manipulations in order to do this out of this, in order to eviscerate these laws out of sight of the American public. And these last, these final, this final effort that President Bush and his cronies are attempting um, is some of the most, are, we're seeing some of the most damaging um, uh, efforts of all to, 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 to finally, to take down the final safeguards, the environment and public health that have been erected by Congress and Republican and Democrats in Congress and the White House over the past 30 years. Um, I'm just, I've, I've filed very detailed testimony about some of the worst of these actions, but I just want to, you know, uh, give you a real life expression of what's, of what's going on. I flew over only a few weeks ago over the Appalachian uh, Mountains, over eastern Kentucky and West Virginia, mainly over the Cumberland Plateau. If the American people could see what I saw on that trip, there would be a revolution in this country. We are literally cutting down the Appalachian Mountains. These the historic landscapes where Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett roamed. Um, the Appalachians, uh, uh, chairman, were, the, uh, were, were a refuge during the Pleistocene Ice Age 20,000, 12,000 years ago. When, um, when where I live and where uh, Congressman Hall, like the district that he represents, was under two miles of ice at that time. And the rest of North America turned into a tundra where there was no forest. And the last refuge for those forests was the Appalachian Mountains. And when the tundras withdrew, when the glaciers withdrew, all of North America was reseeded from the seed stock in those forests. So it's the mother forest of all of North America. And that's why it's the most diverse and abundant temperate forest in the world, because it's the longest living. And today, these mining companies, with the help of their indentured servants in the, in the White House, are doing what the glaciers couldn't accomplish, what the Pleistocene Ice Age couldn't accomplish, which is to flatten the Appalachian Mountains and destroy those forests. They're using um, these giant machines called drag lines, which are 22 stories high. I flew under one of them in a Piper Cub. They cost a half a billion dollars, and they practically dispense with the need for human labor, which indeed is the point. When my father was fighting strip mining in Appalachia back in the 1960s, I remember a conversation that I had with him when I was 14 years old, where he said to me, they're not just destroying the environment, they are permanently impoverishing these communities because there's no way that they will ever be able to regenerate an economy from these barren moonscapes that are left behind. And he said, they're doing it so they can break the unions. And that's exactly what happened. When he told me that, there were 140,000 unionized mine workers in West Virginia digging coal out of tunnels in the ground. Today, there are fewer than 11,000 miners left in the state. A very few of them are unionized because the strip industry isn't. They're taking more coal out of West Virginia than they were in 1968. But at least the difference is back then, at least some of that money was being left in the state for salaries and pensions and reinvestment in those communities. Today, virtually all of it is leaving the state and going straight up to Wall Street, to the big banking houses, to the, well, to the corporate headquarters of Arch Coal, Massey Coal, and Peabody Coal, mainly Massey Coal, and then to the big banking houses like Bank of America and Morgan, which own these operations. 95% of the coal in West Virginia is owned by out-of-state interests, um, which are liquidating the state for cash, literally, using these giant machines and 2,500 tons of explosives that they detonate every day in West Virginia. The power of a Hiroshima bomb once a week. They are blowing the tops off the mountains to get at the coal seams beneath. Then they take these giant machines and they scrape the rock and debris and rubble into the hollows and into the adjacent river valleys. They flatten out the landscapes, they flatten out the valleys. They've already flattened 400,000 acres of the Appalachian Mountains. By the time they get done within a decade, if this, if this rule goes through and, we don't, and you don't get, succeed in getting rid of it, they will have flattened 2,200 miles, an area the size of Delaware. According to EPA, they have already buried 1,200 miles of America's rivers and streams, these critical headwater streams that, that are critical to the hydrology and to the water quality and to the abundance of the wildlife and the, and the forests and the biota of those regions. It's all illegal. You cannot in the United States, under the Clean Water Act, dump rock, debris, and rubble into a waterway without a Clean Water Act permit, and you can never get such a permit. 
So Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, my good friend Joe Lovett, sued the companies in federal, federal court in front of a conservative Republican federal judge, Judge Charles Hayden. And Judge Hayden, during that hearing, I want to tell you this, he said to the Corps of Engineers colonel, who had, was there to testify, he said, you know this is illegal. It says so in the Clean Water Act. How did you happen to start writing these permits to allow these companies to break the law and engage in this criminal activity? And he said, quote, the colonel answered him, said, quote, unquote, I don't know, Your Honor, we just kind of oozed into it. And Judge Hayden, at the end of that hearing, declared, said exactly what I just said. It's all illegal. It's been illegal since day one, and he enjoined all mountaintop mining. Two days from when we got that decision, lobbyists for Peabody Coal and Massey Coal met in the back door of the Interior Department with Gail Norton's first deputy chief, Stephen J. Griles, who was a former lobbyist for those companies. And together, they rewrote the interpretation of one word of the Clean Water Act, the definition of the word fill, to change 30 years of statutory interpretation and make it legal as it is today, not just in West Virginia, but in every state in this country, to dump rock, debris, rubble, garbage, any solid material into any waterway of the United States without a Clean Water Act permit. All you need today, according to the administration, is a rubber stamp permit from the Corps of Engineers, which in some districts you can get over the telephone or through the mail. Now, the last vestige of protection that we had in West Virginia was, a, was a, a stream buffer zone law that was upheld also by Judge Charles Hayden, which said that you can't do this if you're within 100 feet of a stream. Well, this is the law today that this administration is trying to get rid of before it leaves office to make it so there's absolutely no way no, there, there's not a single obstacle or impediment for these companies coming and just flattening the entire Appalachian chain. Now, I think I've run out of time for my prepared statement. I wanted to talk about KFOs because they're, they're even worse. But um, I, if, if, <laughs> you if, have my testimony here, so. I, and I think you're going to have plenty of time uh, and interest in, uh, in uh, the members uh, continuing this discussion with you. We, we thank you, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, I might also note that uh, one of the uh, great citizens of the United States uh, is here with us as well. Uh, Mr. Kennedy's uh, mother, Ethel Kennedy, is uh, sitting out here as well in, in, in this hearing. So let me now turn and uh, uh, recognize our uh, second witness. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jamie Rappaport Clark, who is Executive Vice President for Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, uh, she has spent 20 years in government service, primarily with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, where she served as Director from 1977 to 2001. Uh, during her tenure as Director, we added 2 million acres to the National Wildlife Refuge System and established 27 new wildlife refuges. Welcome, Ms. Clark. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, members of the committee, I appreciate your um, support. Um, uh, it's hard to follow the eloquent testimony of uh, Mr. Kennedy, but uh, what I will add to that um, is just the, the, the sheer frustration of the last eight years. As you mentioned, I was a public servant my entire career up until the day uh, Mr. Bush took office. And it is hard to describe what the last eight years have done to my former colleagues trying their hardest to uh, protect the environment and our natural resources over these years. They're demoralized. Um, um, and have have really um, hit their limit. So I, I'm delighted to see this oversight. I also appreciate the opportunity to shed some light on efforts by this administration dis to dismantle longstanding regulations and policies that protect endangered species in our cherished public lands. In its waning days, this administration is carrying out a calculated strategy to undo decades, decades of commitment to natural resources conservation when it has nothing more to lose and it can largely escape the scrutiny of this Congress and the general public. I'm going to highlight just a few, there are plenty, uh, um, but a few of the most damaging regulatory assaults this morning. 
First, as was mentioned, is the rewrite of the Section 7 regulations uh, under the Endangered Species Act that implement interagency consultation uh, proposed last August. The consultation regulations are the absolute heart of the Endangered Species Act, but the administration is on the, on the verge of allowing any federal agency to avoid consultation if the agency unilaterally decides that an action it sponsors is not anticipated to re result in take of a listed species and its other effects are insignificant or unlikely, not defined. Uh, now, this might sound reasonable. Uh, I, I, you know, I've been at this for many years on the ESA, and, and, and this notion that uh, um, uh, the government agencies can evaluate their own agencies, uh, own actions sir, sound, sounds reasonable. Why have consultation if there's no effects? Sounds bureaucratic. But figuring out whether an action will cause take or other effects often is the issue at hand and why we have an interagency consultation process. It can be, it's a very difficult and complex evaluation. On many uh, occasions, the question of whether take will occur is not readily apparent. It requires an in-depth knowledge of the species behavior, uh, biology, and extant throughout its entire range, just not in the area of the project. Current rules allow federal agencies to decide whether there will be adverse effects from their actions today but the agencies must obtain the occurrence from the experts at the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Service. Under this administration's proposal, however, independent species experts at one of the services no longer are in the review loop. They no longer review federal agency judgments about the effects of actions that it sponsors, clearly allowing the fox to guard the chicken coop. This administration is also proposing to drastically narrow the consideration of federal agency impacts even when consultation does occur. There will be no review of federal actions that contribute to effects on a species, even if it's substantial impacts, if the effects would still occur to some extent without the action. Even though scientific evidence builds every day that greenhouse gas pollution is a significant cause of adverse effects on wildlife, the proposed rules would make it nearly impossible to consider these impacts on species, such as the polar bear, that we all know is threatened by global warming. The Congress should act promptly to stop this dismantling of Section 7 consultation. If legislation is successful by stopping the proposed rule, the incoming administration of President-elect Obama should prevent it from going into effect, if possible, or take steps to minimize its effect while undoing the regulations uh, finalized in the last days. Second is this administration's repackaged effort to prematurely delist the gray wolf in the northern Rocky Mountains, one of this country's most amazing and successful species recovery efforts of the last century. Although two separate federal court decisions have cast doubt on the Bush administration's delisting efforts due to concerns about genetic isolation and the adequacy of state management plans, that hasn't kept this crowd from still trying to push its same failed delisting rule out the door before they leave office next month. Congress should act while it can to stop the proposed delisting of the gray wolf from going forward, undermining one of the great conservation achievements of the last century should not be allowed at the 11th and a half hour. The incoming administration should be given the opportunity to address the inadequacies of this current rule pull together all the stakeholders involved, develop a science-based management plan that will guide recovery and address the concerns of both people and wolves. Third is the Bush administration's abuse of regulations to minimize protection for the polar bear. Last May, uh, compelled uh, by a hearing held by you, Mr. Chairman, in the face of insurmountable scientific evidence indicating that polar bears in the United States face extinction by mid-century in our lifetimes due to global warming, the administration finally, after much delay, listed the polar bear as a threatened species. We had about a nanosecond to cheer uh, when we realized that they lost no time in making sure that the listing would not result in any greater protection for the species by issuing concurrently a so-called Section 4D rule under the Endangered Species Act with no notice and no opportunity for public comment. In my federal career, I have never seen that happen. 
The Bush administration has been unbelievable. Um, they argue that other laws and international treaties that make the Endangered Species Act protection superfluous. In other words, business as usual is good enough for the polar bear. If that were true, of course, then the polar bear wouldn't have needed the Endangered Species Act protections in the first place. The incoming Obama administration should rescind the illegal 4D rule and replace it with a rule that actually improves the polar bear's chances of actually surviving and recovering. And finally, Mr. Chairman, the Bush administration has launched an incredible assault of last-minute rulemakings on our public lands, and we could go on and on and on about that, including efforts that threaten our national parks and fast-tracking of oil shale development that fails to protect people, our wildlife, and the U.S. Treasury. The Bush administration's assault on our nation's stewardship of endangered species and public lands presents challenges of unprecedented magnitude and scope for Congress and the incoming administration of President-elect Obama. We look forward to working with you under your leadership to restore our commitment to protection of these magnificent and irreplaceable natural resources. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clark, very much. Our next witness is Mr. Jeffrey Homestead. Uh, he is a partner at Bracewell and Giuliani. Uh, previously, Mr. Homestead served at the Environmental Protection Agency as Assistant Administrator for Air and Radiation. Prior to that, Mr. Homestead was a partner at Latham and Watkins and served as Associate Counsel for President George H.W. Bush from uh, 1989 to 1993. Uh, welcome, Mr. Homestead. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the chance to be here again today, and uh, I, I always um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to shed a little light on some of these issues. As you noted, I, uh, uh, my expertise is primarily in, in air pollution issues. And I'm going to depart from my, uh, from my written statement. If I can just m make a couple of points that I think should be interesting to everybody uh, on this panel and, and folks up there as well. Um, I, I, I always find these, um, these hearings interesting because of the failure to look at kind of the actual data that are out there. Um, you and others on this panel have accused the Bush administration of eviscerating the Clean Air Act. I was amused to see uh, your report about the radical anti-environmental agenda of the Bush administration. And so my question is this, how is it that air quality throughout the country is so much better today than it was eight years ago? How is it that pollution is down significantly compared to eight years ago? The fact of the matter is the Bush administration, at least in the areas that I know, has tried to do, has tried to achieve our environmental goals in the most sensible, cost-effective way. And it's, it, it, we, we haven't always been successful, and there are some things that, that I certainly wish we could, have, uh, we could have accomplished that we were not able to. But I, I, last night on the computer, as I was thinking about this hearing, I, I, I looked up on an EPA website where they actually track emissions, and these are actually measured emissions from coal-fired power plants. And I know my friend Jock, John Walk cares about those, Mr. Kennedy does as well. Eight years ago, SO2 emissions from coal-fired power plants were uh, just a little over 13 million tons a year. Last year, the last year for which we have emissions measurements, those are now below 9 million tons a year. So that's roughly a 35 percent reduction. The reduction in NOx emissions is even greater. In, uh, 90, in 1999, the emissions were about 2.4, uh, I'm sorry, 5.5 million tons of NOx, and last year they were 3.5 million. The, 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 there are legitimate kind of regulatory policy questions, and you know you may have a different view of the way we ought to, to, to do things, whether it's through aggressive enforcement or whether it's sort of through more effective regulatory programs. But the fact of the matter is the air is cleaner today in the United States because of actions taken by the first Bush administration, the Clinton administration, this Bush administration. It's an ongoing legacy that we all should be proud of. And the, the other thing that I like to mention is, you know, EPA does careful analysis. And there's, what, 17,000 employees and a handful of political of, of, of appointees. And most of the folks there are career staff who are dedicated public servants. They did an analysis of the most important health protections achieved by EPA in its history. 
and they found three rules that were substantially more, that, that were far and away the most important rules that EPA has ever done. Number one was the phase down of lead and gasoline, which took place back in the 1970s, 1980s. Number two was the clean air interstate rule, which is now in kind of legal limbo because of a court case. But the second most important rule in terms of improving public health was issued under this administration, and the third was also issued under this administration, having to do with reducing diesel emissions. So I, again, I, I, I'm entertained by some of the comments that have made, but I find them troubling insofar as they're completely devoid of what's actually happened out there. So I, you know, I, I know that there's a lot more forest cover now in the U.S. than there was 20, 30 years ago. I'm not an expert on public lands. I, I, I know something about the Endangered Species Act, and I, I just think it's a little disingenuous to suggest that the Endangered Species Act is the tool that anybody intended to deal with climate change. Climate change is an important issue. We ought to think about how to deal with it. But the way to deal with it is not by um, doing an Endangered Species Act consultation on hundreds of individual projects, which collectively have a less than trivial impact on CO2 emissions. Let's talk about the best way to achieve our goals Instead of, uh, instead of somehow suggesting that there's a calculated uh, effort here by the Bush administration, which has really made a lot of progress on all these environmental issues. Now, I, I can't see the clock. I may be well past my time already. Um, but I, you know, rather than talking about midnight regulations, uh, let's, let's talk about individual specific issues and what is the best way to achieve the objectives that I think we all share. Thank you very much, and I, I really would be quite happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Homestead, very much. And our final witness, Mr. John Walk, um, is the uh, Clean Air uh, uh, Director at uh, Natural Resources Defense uh, Council. Uh, he, uh, prior to joining the NRDC, Mr. Walk served as at the Environmental Protection Agency, where he helped implement the Clean Air Act. Mr. Walk is one of the preeminent experts on clean air issues in our country. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you, Chairman Markey and members of the committee. I am pleased to appear before the committee for this important hearing. I'm even more pleased that the two harmful air pollution rules I address at length in my written testimony were abruptly abandoned by, yesterday, by EPA yesterday, which renders nearly all of my te written testimony moot, so I look forward to questions from the committee. Um, uh, in, in all seriousness, though, let me first answer uh, Jeff's question. Uh, how is it that the air is cleaner today? Uh, fundamentally, because of steps taken by the Clinton administration and the first Bush administration, and even before that, the Reagan administration. Um, it is important to recognize something about clean air laws and rules in this country. There is basically an eight to 10 year lag time between the time a rule is adopted and the time that the effects of a rule are felt. So important rules like the acid rain program passed by this Congress in 1990, uh, the Knox SIP call passed by the Clinton administration in the late 90s are bearing fruit today and are responsible for the reductions that Mr. Holmstead uh, mentioned. The rules adopted by the Bush administration are not. The diesel rule that they adopted, um, a, a positive rule uh, based upon successes they inherited from the Clinton administration and continued with the fine professional staff at EPA, and they deserve credit for that. The compliance dates for that rule will not occur by and large to achieve uh, their, their measurable meaningful reductions until after they leave office. Uh, the Clean Air Interstate Rule, which was struck down in court, had compliance dates of 2010 and 2015. Uh, their Mercury Rule, 2010-2015, Clear Skies, 2018. Again, there is a lag time, and we will enjoy some of the benefits of their diesel rule, but thankfully we will not enjoy the disbenefits of the rules that were struck down in court. Uh, abandoning the two rules that were announced yesterday was the right thing to do. The power plant rule would have resulted in enormous emissions increase of smog and soot pollution. EPA admitted John, it itself. John, how can you say that? That's just not true. Uh, if, uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was testifying now, but um, if you'd like to testify There's again. Going to be, there will be plenty of time. Very good. I'll look, um, I'll look forward to that. EPA's rulemaking record uh, itself projected that the rule would have increased pollution in entire counties throughout states like Indiana, Tennessee, Michigan, Arizona, Georgia, Ohio, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, New York, Illinois, and others. I took that from EPA's own projections. As the chairman mentioned in his opening statement, EPA projected 
um, in a letter to Congressman Waxman that the rule would have allowed a, a carbon dioxide emissions increase of, of 74 million tons per year. That is roughly equivalent to the total annual CO2 emissions of about 14 average coal-fired power plants, or the annual emissions from 50 million vehicles. There are about 250 million vehicles in this country, so that's one-fifth of the total U.S. population. Um, adding 74 million tons of CO2 to the atmosphere each year would nearly double the amount that EPA removes under its voluntary Energy Star program. These were enormous emissions increases, and it's a very good thing that the rule was abandoned. Uh, the EPA yesterday acknowledged in scrapping these two highly controversial air pollution rules that they were classic midnight regulations and that EPA would not issue for them for that reason. You can look at to today's Washington Post and New York Times articles. I welcome those explanations, but at the same time we should recognize that they're deeply questionable explanations. Uh, on the very same day that EPA scrapped these two rules, it issued, guess what, a midnight deregulation weakening a Clean Air Act rule governing emissions from factory farms and mines. The, the question of midnight regulations is unfortunately one that is not going away, despite announcements like yesterday. Uh, with permission of the chairman, I would like to enter into the record a 60-page document prepared by EPA. It's an internal document that I obtained and I don't believe has been publicly released before uh, that contains EPA's own list of rules that they plan to adopt in 60 days from the Environmental Protection Agency. It's startling the number of days uh, uh, the number of rules that will be issued and signed in December and January according to this own list, so I commend it to the committee's attention. Uh, EPA will issue controversial rules and harmful rules under the Clean Air Act um, by January 20th. They have told us they will do so. One, for example, will allow increased emissions from chemical plants, oil refineries, pharmaceutical plants, and the like that have multiple pieces of equipment. Uh, they also issued a rule uh, just last month, uh, actually, that uh, will reduce the number of lead monitors that should be required in this country. After the rule was directly overruled by the White House less than 24 hours before the rule's signature, it prohibited EPA from monitoring lead emissions from facilities that emit more than 1,000 pounds per year of lead. Instead, the White House allowed EPA only to monitor facilities emission, uh, emitting more than 2,000 pounds of lead, resulting in more than 200 lead polluters nationwide that will now go unmonitored. Uh, this will affect residents in Indiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, Texas, and Minnesota that will not have the benefit of lead monitors downwind of cement plants, oil refineries, or lead smelters in their communities thanks to this irresponsible White House um, intervention. Um, in conclusion, I will just note that the, uh, the, the Obama administration already has a lot to do to clean up uh, air pollution and global warming pollution from power plants. We really should not saddle them with the additional insult and injury of these midnight regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Walk, very much. Um, so let's have, a, let's have a little discussion then, because uh, some have asserted that, uh, uh, that uh, the Bush administration's midnight regulations uh, are not really rushed and they are not really secretive. Uh, and that is a contention which is being made and that they are being uh, properly implemented with all deliberation uh, and a proper review. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, uh, could you respond to that assertion that they are in fact going through uh, a proper uh, regulatory uh, process in well, their destruction of these rules? There are many, many examples. I mean, normally regulations, what the Bush administration has even said in the past in a court case over the, um, over, um, over power plant, plant regulations, the Bush, uh, and that, that I argued, we have recently had Bush administration um, attorneys argue that it takes eight years to pass a regulation. Um, these regulations, many of them, in many, many of these instances, I mean, John Walk is just, you know, this is a, actually a very heavy document that appears to have hundreds of rules in it. There's supposed to be notice and comment. There's supposed to be an opportunity for the public to comment on these rules, to participate in the regulatory process. And uh, I just don't see how it's possible to issue the, the public doesn't even know this at this point. So this is, if, if for the administration to claim that, um, that, uh, that these are going through a normal regulatory process is just is specious. 
Well, let, me, uh, let me go to Mr. Walker, and then we'll go to you, Mr. Homestead. Mr. Walker. Uh, Chairman Markey, there's one very easy test to determine whether a rule has, is being rushed or not, and that is uh, when and whether the rule has been lodged for review uh, at the White House. The Office of Man Management and Budget has a, either a 60 or a 90 day review period under executive order to look at final rules. And uh, before I came, I, I looked at the OMB website, and um, many, many of these rules, uh, including ones that we know will be adopted uh, by January 20th, have not even been sent over to the White House. They are not going to have their normal review. They are going to have a, a, re a review that is by definition rushed. Now, that's a classic definition of midnight regulation to me. They are hurrying up these rules. Uh, the reason the rules were scrapped yesterday is not because they passed the November 1st deadline in the Josh Bolton memo, as the White House is now claiming. Count the number of rules that have been issued since November 1st. There are many. Uh, by their own standard, they should not issue any more rules for the rest of the administration because, as they said in the post today, that would be a midnight regulation. They will not meet that test. This list proves it. And there are rules that the White House uh, is looking at now that are going to be jammed out by the 20th. All right, Mr. Homestead, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, uh, all I know is that uh, EPA follows the Administrators' Procedures Act. John is incorrect in saying that all these rules go through OMB review. Most of them don't because OMB only reviews rules that are considered to be significant rules, and there's an ongoing discussion between OMB and many agencies. Look, it is, it is a historical fact that near the end of every administration, there's a lot of things that get done because people respond to deadlines. All of the issues that I know about have been in the regulatory process for years. Right? And they have to go through a comment period, and the ones that John doesn't like have been out for public comment. And so the question is, is there something nefarious about trying to clean up the issues that you've been working on for years? Now, I don't have privy to this particular list, and so I'm a little surprised to hear uh, John and Mr. Kennedy both accusing the administration of violating the law. I, I, you'd have to look at each one of these and say, okay, was this a rule that went out for notice and comment? Is it a rule that qualifies as a significant rule? But, but <laughs> the, the idea, that, and, and again, there's several articles that I referred to in my written testimony where there's a natural tendency in our system for every administration to try to finish its work before it leaves office. Let me come the, back the, to the, record, the record is held, by the way, by the Clinton administration in terms of number of regulations or pages. Second most is the Carter administration. We'll see how this administration ends up, but there is always a slug of things that people are trying to finish up before they leave office. But if they don't follow proper procedures, they are clearly illegal. So we'll come back to you, uh, Mr. Walk uh, and Mr. Kennedy. What do you have to say to Mr. Homestead? Well, um, the, the Bush administration significantly expanded review by OMV down to, you know, guidance documents that they look at that, that don't meet anyone's definition of significant or impacts of $100 million or more. So, you know, they've, they've been very selective in, in how they follow their own rules. Um, but I, I think it's clear that they, uh, you know, that the, these rules will be pushed out. Um, and I, now, I should say, the, the, the rules in this list, as far as I can tell, have undergone, um, uh, you know, public review and notice and comment. But that, you know, that would be true of any uh, midnight deregulation as well, by definition, unless they were flagrantly violating the APA, as Jeff said. But uh, that still doesn't obviate the fact that the, the, these are harmful midnight deregulations that they will But issue. how can you say that without looking at the regulation and seeing what it says? I have looked at the clean air regulations and- Well, I, I mean, there's that long list. I'd be, you got to look at the regulation, say, is that, this a good one or is this a bad that's one? That's why it's being entered into the record. Good. Uh, and Mr. Kennedy, do you, have, do you have any comment you'd like to add at this point? I think Mr. Walk has covered it. Okay, great. Thank you. My time has expired. We'll turn and recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I'm sure that all the administrations are uh, trying to finish up their agenda. Uh, I don't think that's, that's any different. Uh, uh, do you think there, there has been this much activity uh, by past presidents, whether they were Democratic or, pres or, or Republican, uh, with regard to uh, the environment, uh, Mr. Holmes said? You know, I, I'm not sure, and I, I, 
it, and the studies that have been done are, are not entirely satisfactory because they just look at the number of pages in the Federal Register that were issued during the last three months. So I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. But it, it is, as you mentioned, it is really quite clear that you know, we all respond to deadlines and we know we're running out of time and we try to get our work done. So I, I know that there was a number of things done at EPA right before the end of the Clinton administration. And you know, because of concern about midnight regs, when I got there, one of the first things we did was review all the midnight regs. And what we discovered is that they had done a darn good job, with only one exception. There was one thing that we thought was done improperly. But you know, a lot of these things were very Regarding controversial. The environment was it? Yeah, these were all environmental. And, but we, you know, we looked at some controversial rules, and we decided the Clinton administration had done the right thing, even though they issued the rules on the last week of the administration. Uh, let me ask the, the other three witnesses, uh, beginning with with uh, Ms. Clark. Uh, the Obama administration uh, will will take uh, office on the twentieth. Of of the midnight rulings that you have seen, uh, and those, uh, Mr. Walker, in, in, in your uh, testimony, um, are the most egregious, and that, that the Clinton, admi the, that the Obama administration will need to move quickly to either reverse or halt. Which, what, what, what have you seen thus far that you think would, would require uh, as, as rapid a response as possible? Uh I'll start. Yes. Um, um, certainly, <clears throat> um, the attempts uh, to undermine the Endangered Species Act. What this administration has failed to do legislatively, and goodness, they've tried. They've been quite persistent over the last eight years. They failed to do it legislatively. They have tried to now accomplish administratively in the 11th hour. So these Section 7 regs um, have got to be uh, overturned or thwarted. Um, clearly, um, regulations that impact or, or really undermine chances of survival for species we care deeply about, like the gray wolf, the polar bear, um, will need to be addressed. And then there's a whole host of, of um, public lands. Uh, this recent oil shale regulation that is devastating to over 11 million acres uh, uh, of, of lands in, in Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. Um, BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, has been particularly hard hit by this administration's uh, in, uh, zeal to pay homage to their industry friends. And uh, that whole agency deserves a look. There are a lot of regulations being finalized or in the mode against the wishes of governors, even in the West, that will need to be addressed uh, right out of the box. Mr. Kennedy. Well, number one on my list would be the mountaintop removal that I talked about, about the 100-foot um, the, uh, stream buffer zone, because the damage that will be caused as a result of that will be allowed, because as a result of that rule, will be very quick, and it will be irreparable, and it will be monumental, literally destroying entire mountain ranges. Um, already 460 of the largest mountains in West Virginia have been taken down and are just holes in the ground. You can actually go to Google Earth and go to the home page and type in your zip code and you can look at the mountain that was, uh, that has been removed in order to heat your home. But um, this will, uh, this will remove the final restraint on that practice and um, so I would say that that would be number one on my list. Um, the factory farming regulations removing the efforts by the administration to remove factory farms from not only the Clean Water Act, but also from uh, CERCLA and APGRA, which, are, uh, which regulate uh, uh, the air discharges from those facilities. But as you know, these are facilities that, you know, over the past 20 years, farming has been transformed in this country um, and taken off the farms by a few large corporations which shoehorn millions of chickens into tiny cages um, where they literally can't turn around and then dose them with hormones and arsenic so that they literally lay their guts out over a short and miserable life. Um, hundreds of thousands of hogs are put into warehouses, again, in tiny cages where they produce um, millions of, of tons of waste. A hog produces 10 times the waste, the amount of waste as a human being. So a facility with 100,000 hogs produces the same amount of fecal waste as a city of a million people, 
Well, the, uh, the waste is, is, is as virulent and obnoxious and as dangerous as human waste, and it should be regulated by the Clean Water Act, and under the law it was, but this administration has removed it from that regulation so that these big corporations can simply dump the waste into the waters or onto the land. And um, there was uh, this, um, the, the uh, Bush administration for eight years has been trying to completely remove all legal restraints on these practices. Um, and this final regulation will in fact do that. So I would say that this was the, the regulations on factory farms are probably some of the worst. Uh, Congressman, I would mention just two air pollution regulations. Uh, one uh, recently in which uh, EPA rejected the unanimous advice of its scientific advisors to weaken the health standards uh, that govern uh, uh, smog pollution, our protections against smog pollution. Uh, EPA rejected those uh, unanimous scientific recommendations when it adopted the ozone standard. Uh, and secondly, a rule that we expect to be issued by the end of the term uh, that, that I refer to in my written testimony in which uh, EPA will create uh, essentially a loophole in accounting gimmicks to allow oil refineries and chemical plants to pollute more under the Clean Air Act of uh, carcinogens and, and smog and soot pollution. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Clark, in, uh, in the rules that you have seen issued or uh, uh, canceled or in any actions that you've would noticed over the last uh, eight years, has there been any uh, effective um, regulation uh, that you have seen that may help the overfishing and the depopulation of uh, the fisheries of the Northeast, uh, something that's been written about a lot lately? Unfortunately, not to my knowledge. And in fact, um, the undermining of the Endangered Species Act uh, uh, changes that they have underway will potentially harm all listed species, 1,400 listed species, and those that are trending towards impairment as well. So for those species that are in trouble in the ocean environment uh, um, and, and may in fact deserve protection of the Endangered Species Act, uh, this, this regulation will certainly hurt them. And so I expect that the way that this government has gone about managing imperiled species uh, um, will uh, certainly result in more species being imperiled uh, than less. And in your opinion, uh, Ms. Clark, could the Fish and Wildlife Service have possibly adequately reviewed the approximately 300,000 public comments on the administration's proposed Section 7 rule in the time that they allotted for that work? Oh, ab absolutely not, because I know enough about a number of the comments, including many from this body, that were quite substantive in nature. And, and to see from a career official this all-hands-on-deck call that went across the agency in an email calling for uh, anybody and anybody to come in from Tuesday through Friday to work eight hours a day to analyze the almost 300,000 comments uh, to then forward on to the Department of the Interior's solicitor's office. Um, there's just no way they could do much more than stack them in categories. What was also, though, significant about that email and about the way the process was handled is indicative of what's happened in this administration, and that is they have totally um, taken away the opinion, or disregarded is maybe a better word, disregarded the opinion of the career biologist, and, and in essence have totally politicized implementation of environmental law. Um, and so they, they in essence asked Section 7 biologists, experts on the law, to come to town um, and in fact, they couldn't get enough of them, so they brought them from the Park Service and other agencies and said, okay, s stack the comments so that you can then forward them to the solicitor's office where they will be reviewed and analyzed for policy response. That just didn't happen in my entire time in government. We had a very collegial relationship with the lawyers in the solicitor's office, but they didn't unilaterally make policy without biological understanding of uh, the impacts of implementation of law. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I was wondering, uh, have you seen or heard of 
uh, any attempts or any machines being built uh, to remediate the removal of mountaintops to try to restore the topography as it previously was? And have no, you any I, idea how expensive that would be? Well, the, uh, the law says that once the, um, uh, once the mountains are removed and the coal has been extracted, that the, um, that the company has to then restore the mountaintop to its natural state and the soils to their natural state. They have to um, uh, take the soils and put them back on uh, and reclaim the area. But um, I've actually been on the reclaimed mountaintops. And what happened is that the, um, that, uh, the state agency, which is a classic captured agency um, that is uh, basically just a hand puppet for the, regula for the regulated industry, along with the, um, the Office of Surface Mining and EPA under the Bush administration, have approved an interpretation of the law to say that rock is the equivalent of soil. <laughs> so that instead of putting soil on the mountaintops, they can put rock on the mountaintops. And so they just take the rock and put it back. And when you walk on it, you're just walking on a huge rock pile where nothing can grow. There's, a, there's some little kind of a, a, an exotic grass and some lichens that can grow on it. But these were areas that had some of the finest uh, temperate forests on Earth. And you will never see those forests again ever until the, we have another ice age. So um, that's, what the, you know, that's the kind of the level of deception of public deception um, and, the, uh, and the manipulation of these laws that we've seen unprecedented come out of the Bush administration. And the, the people who dream up these schemes um, uh, you know, are so venal and mendacious and dishonest because the law is there that says you have to grow the forest back. Everybody knows it. Everybody can read that law. And yet you have a conspiracy among these regulatory officials who, um, you know, who are basically just, as I said, indentured servants for the lobbying groups and for the industries that they regulated. And they come in there and save and, and plunder our natural resources and plunder the best of our country. Uh, I, I say one other thing, just an answer to sure. your, uh, your, your earlier question. We just argued this week a, um, a, against EPA a, um, a, a case in the Supreme Court um, which, the, Fed, which um, the Bush administration is trying to remove all regulations on uh, or weaken the regulations for fish kills at power plants. Now, power plants are the single greatest killer of fish in the oceans. The East Coast power plants, by their own records, kill a trillion fish a day on their in a trillion fish a year on their intake screens, a trillion fish a year on their intake screens. There's a single power plant, the Salem nuclear power plant in the Delaware River that sucks up the entire freshwater flow of the Delaware every day, and it literally combs the life out of it. Martin Marietta, which is you know the, the company that put the man on the moon, that was hired by the Salem nuclear power plant to do its fish kill studies, said that that plant alone kills 175 billion bay anchovies every day, every year, 165 billion weak fish every year. And it stopped counting after that and said this is going to cause the crash of all the fish in the Delaware estuary system, which in fact happened. And so these, these uh, power plants, you know, more than the commercial fishery, are impacting huge, huge mortalities on our ocean-going fish. And the Bush administration is doing everything in its power to try to fight the regulations that would require these plants to install the best available technology for preserving fish. Uh, thank you. I'll just, if I may, just uh, wrap up by saying, uh, I, I, in response to uh, comments by Mr. Holmstead and Mr. Walk, uh, that in New York, uh, first of all, the last couple of summers we've had hot spells, extended uh, uh, heat spells, where the entire state has been under an air quality alert. Now, I remember I've grown up in Elmira and spent most of my life in the Hudson Valley. I remember many times having cities be under an air quality alert, city of Poughkeepsie, city of Peekskill, city of New York, Albany, what have you. But having the farmland and the forest land and the, the, Apple, the uh, uh, Adirondacks, the entire state be under an air quality alert where people with asthma or uh, respiratory 
uh, problems, uh, the elderly and the young are told to stay indoors, hmm. not in specific cities, but in the entire state. To me, that's only happened in the last couple of years, and it's inconsistent with uh, a statement that air quality is better. I realize that's not a scientific sample of the entire country, but that is an experience uh, that this state has had. And, uh, and lastly, regarding the, whether or not this is, is intentional and systematic, uh, you know, responding to, once again, uh, to you, Mr. Homestead, and th those who say that this is somehow different, uh, we had the administrator of EPA sit here on the one-year anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in Mass versus EPA and refused to give us the internal documents that the uh, staff at EPA had been working on, and we were unanimously, both sides of the aisle, forced uh, to vote for a subpoena for those documents because the administration, as they do with the VA and as they do with the Justice Department and as they do across all um, uh, branches of the executive, uh, refuse uh, to produce documents for your oversight. And, and so I do believe it is systematic and I'm looking forward to working with a more, uh, uh, a more legal uh, administration and one who believes in the law and in the Constitution and checks and balances. And I yield back. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Inslee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Homestead. You made a comment in your opening statement that you were entertained by some of the statements that were made by some of your witnesses. And I want to tell you that this was not an entertaining experience for us. You know, maybe you'd think it's a joyous occasion because it's the last hearing the U.S. Congress will hear about the multiple depredations and failures of environmental policy by this administration, but it's not something that I find entertaining. I just find it flabbergasting that you come before us to crow about the achievements of this administration saying that pollution is better than when this administration came in. In fact, the carbon dioxide levels of the planet have risen significantly, which is the number one most dangerous, most threatening pollution. And while that has been occurring, the only strategy that the Bush administration has had to deal with it is one, to gut the listing of the polar bear to make sure that it really didn't mean anything and didn't occasion the reduction of carbon dioxide. And number two, the only other strategy the administration has had is to be at least partially responsible for a major recession that might reduce economic activity, which is not the preferred global warming strategy we ought to have. Now, I'm upset about it. I think a lot of people are. I got to be a grandfather for the first time about a week and a half ago, and if my son lives to the ripe age of 100, 35% uh, of the birds in the world may be endangered, 52% of the amphibians, and 71% of the corals may no longer exist. And for eight years, the Bush administration fiddled while the most dangerous gas in the atmosphere increased while the Bush administration fiddled around. I would like to think that the administration would leave on some note of grace on this last hearing during the Bush administration. And I would like to give you an opportunity to express some sorrow that this administration did not act to deal with this most dangerous pollutant to the great disadvantage of our grandkids. And I want to give you that opportunity to leave on some note of grace. Well, I, I appreciate your kind invitation, but I find your question somewhat disingenuous. When I talked about pollution, I was very specific. If you look at air quality in New York or your state or anywhere else, air quality is measured by, by scientists around the, around the country is significantly improved. Now, no one has ever talked about CO2 as an air quality issue because it's not dangerous to breathe unless you happen to, unless it's at, at levels that are, are orders of magnitude higher than we talk about today. It is clear that climate change is a major issue. But don't tell me that CO2 is the most dangerous gas we face today when there are still people who are dying because of fine particle pollution and other things. When it comes to CO2 emissions, this administration has done at least as well as every other country in the world and at least as well as the Clinton administration. The Clinton administration said they had authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate CO2. They chose not to exercise it very carefully. So when this administration came in, 
it has undertaken many things to reduce the energy intensity of our economy. And if you look at the Europeans, if you look at the Japanese, if you look at any other economy since the beginning of this administration, they've performed no better than we have. It is a huge, huge challenge that we have, sir. But to somehow suggest that this administration has failed in its efforts, it has spent more time and more effort. And, and although many other countries talk a good story, they have not achieved anything either. You know why? It's enormously difficult. I so think I think you, all I think of us need all of question. us all of us need to be engaged in that in that opportunity. But it's going to take decades and billions and trillions of dollars to reduce our emissions of CO2. Thank you, Mr. Homestead. I think you've answered my question, which is you do not intend to leave on a note of grace of showing your story about I this thought failure. It was and I'm going to I'm going to I'll report to my grandchild when he is at the appropriate age that you were proud of your record to watch this international global disaster unfold and do nothing about it. That's what I'll report about your last opportunity. I want to ask Ms. Clark and Mr. Kennedy, uh, procedurally, what do we need to do to roll back these onerous provisions? How can we do that in the, in the quickest, most efficacious way during the Obama administration? What do we need to do day one? How do we hasten this process? Well, there are I'll speak as a non-lawyer, as a wildlife biologist, um, just to be clear. Um, there are a couple of things. Uh, it would be, speaking of grace, it, it would be nice, um, uh, like they have done on the air regulations, for them to decline to finalize the Section 7 regulations. Uh, that would be uh, a point of grace. And for an administration that has touted their desire for an orderly transition, uh, that would be incredibly helpful for the incoming Secretary of the Interior because it's a huge issue to have to inherit. Um, absent that, and if they do go forward to finalize, um, uh, uh, know that there are a uh, host of uh, environmental groups, conservation groups, uh, like Defenders of Wildlife, that is poised to file suit uh, against uh, implementation of the regulations, and so I imagine we'll be involved in some dialogue. Um, also, there's certainly the opportunity for the new administration to issue executive orders, uh, in essence, um, uh, dictating how they expect the incoming departments uh, to address uh, global warming considerations and impact on the environment, including endangered species, while they move with due haste to um, uh, repropose and undo the regulations. And uh, just a point about these regulations that I, I forgot to mention, but it's of interest uh, in, in uh, the, the chairman's uh, comment earlier on about how we can assert that these are midnight and last ditch and, and, and uh, a, a bit over the top. Uh, these Section 7 regulations, uh, you know, when, 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 when uh, a bureau um, wants to issue regulations of this magnitude, regulations like Section 7 that affect every discretionary action of any federal agency. So it has wide, broad impact on the federal government. Um, and I know from personal experience the debate and the hand-wringing and the wrangling that goes on in the interagency clearance process. Uh, not the least of which this regulation um, ran under the radar screen, didn't show up on the dockets that these regs normally show up on, whether it's in the Department of the Interior or the Office of Management and Budget. But I heard from at least three of the bureaus um, uh, Department of, the, uh, Department of Agriculture, the Environmental Protection Agency, and even the Department of Defense, that in essence they were um, uh, persuaded to, quote, stand down. Because what typically happens is these, these bureaus and uh, individual agencies will provide all this comment that has to be reconciled before these regs can go forward. What in fact happened is they were in essence ordered to, um, if they you know, it's kind of like what your mother says, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. And, and because they couldn't agree with these regulations, they said nothing. So the notion that there was unanimity and everybody agreed with these regs in the federal government is 
quite the contrary. And in fact, you know, Forest Service, Department of Defense, uh, EPA is very concerned about now having that responsibility unilaterally as well as the accountability uh, unto themselves without the expert backup of, of the wildlife agencies. So this issue has got to be fixed for the inherent forward movement. And the only time in this administration they really got away with this in total has been on the National Fire Plan. Uh, for the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service to implement unilaterally decision making on fire management and fire planning. Albeit late, the Fish and Wildlife Service finally got around to monitoring the impact of decisions made during this self consultation process and have now determined that over um, almost 70 percent of the unilateral decisions made by the Forest Service and the BLM on this fire management plan implementation have been wrong. And BLM and the Forest Service have wildlife experts. Therein lies the problem. And so it's a um, big challenge. Thank you. Ms. Kennedy, you want to add something to that? Um, there's three things that they should be doing. One is that Obama administration should stay all rules that are still pending, and they should prevent publication of those rules in the Federal Register, all new rules in the Federal Register. That's something that the Cheney, uh, Bush-Cheney administration did um, uh, beginning the first day of that administration with the Clinton's uh, administration's last minute rules. Second, the Obama administration should begin talks with Congress under the Congressional Review Act. The Congressional Review Act, as you know, is a statute that gives Congress the power to review regulations after 100 days um, and, uh, and then to, if they disapprove of those regulations or believe they're inconsistent with the law or the public interest, Congress has the power to uh, pass a resolution of disapproval, uh, which then the president can sign, which effectively vetoes the regulation. That's a, that's a real choice that I, I hope that you will exercise. And, um, and then, uh, of course, the Obama administration ought to do what, again, take a uh, page from the Bush-Cheney um, uh, uh, playbook and refuse to defend regulations that it doesn't like in court. Uh, so that when, uh, uh, when environmental groups, when citizens groups, when public health groups sue the administration over the regulations that, uh, that we can achieve a regulation that protects public health and that protects the environment. I just want to make one comment um, in reaction to some of the things that Mr. Homestead, some of the claims that Mr. Homestead just made. One is uh, that, the, that nobody's ever, ever called uh, um, a carbon, a, uh, an, an air quality problem. In fact, uh, that was a, uh, a pretense that the, uh, that the administration has tried to uh, 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 put over on the American people for the, for the past eight years, but NRDC sued the administration, won the case in court, in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has said, indeed, carbon is a pollutant, a regulated pollutant. It was one of the games that uh, they played to try to, to avoid regulation of, as you, what you call the most dangerous pollutant in the world, which is carbon right now. Um, I, you know, I also have to say that it, it was, I was some, somewhat surprised to hear Mr. Homestead talk about his great concern for the worst pollutant, which was ozone and particulates, since the Bush administration, under his leadership, did everything in its power to make sure that there was no regulation of ozone and particulates. As you know, ozone and particulates uh, emissions- I'm just, I'm just puzzled. That's, that's factually incorrect. Ozone and particulate emissions were supposed to be removed from coal burning power plants 18 years ago under the Clean Air Act. The, um, uh, this, it, it, this I, is I, I'm sorry, but that's just incorrect oh. as a matter of. Oh, that is, that is correct. <laughs> I, I'm the, sorry, it's, it's, the administration, it's not. The Clinton administration, when this administration came in, because many of the plants did, including in the state of Massachusetts, all of the plants installed scrubbing uh, uh, mechanisms to remove the ozone and particulates. Other states didn't do that, states where corporations can easily dominate the state political landscapes. The Clinton administration, there were 400 plants that did not remove ozone and particulates. The Clinton administration was prosecuting the worst 52 of those plants criminally and civilly. 
they were investigating 200 other plans. One of the first things that the Bush administration did when it came into office was to order the Justice Department and EPA to drop all those lawsuits. As a result, the top three enforcers at EPA, Bruce Buckheit, Sylvia Lawrence, and Eric Schaefer, all resigned their jobs in protest. These were not Democrats. These were people who had served under the Bush administration and the previous Reagan administration. They left their jobs because they were ordered by this administration not to do their jobs to reduce ozone and particulates. Immediately after that, the administration under Mr. Homestead's leadership um, abolished illegally, as it turns out, because we won the lawsuit after seven years, the new source rule, which was the heart and soul of the Clean Air Act, the most important provision in that statute, that's the rule that required those companies to clean up 18 years ago. So, you know, I have three sons I have, have asthma. I, I, I have four One kids. out of every four black children now in America's cities have, have asthma. One out of every eight kids born in this country today have asthma. We have a pediatric asthma epidemic. The principal cause of asthma attacks is ozone and particulates, a million asthma attacks a year, a million lost work days. This is stuff that really hurts our country and causes tremendous pain to people. And this administration went and abolished those controls so that all those plants in Massachusetts that installed that expensive equipment are now at a profound disadvantage in the marketplace. And um, I'm going to be able to watch my children gasping for air on bad air days because somebody gave money to a politician. And if you go to EPA's website today, EPA's website, not NRDC, you'll see that that single decision alone by EPA kills, and by this White House, kills 18,000 Americans every, every year at minimum. Just a second. I, 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 I can't sit here. I, I don't know anything about mountaintop mining, but I know a lot about the Clean Air Act. <laughs> And maybe we should have a little more polite discussion about this. The things that you are saying are fabricated. They are not true. Mr. Homestead, if you'd like to write a letter. I, I would be happy to. I, I, would, I would be happy to. I, but I think people ought to confine my time, themselves my time to talking is, about things time that they know expired. something about. Mr. Homestead, we will be happy to put into, into the record a letter from you. But my time has expired. And thankfully, this administration's time has expired. And as my last comment, I look forward to changing and closing this book and opening a new one of an administration that I hope and do believe will reverse this sorry record and, and, and bring back a, the law and the environmental value to this country. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Let, the, the chair will recognize himself uh, again for a round of questions. Let me go to you, Mr. Rappaport Clark. Let's go to the, environment, the, the, to the Endangered Species Act. Let's lay out the state of play right now of the Endangered Species Act, what the administration is planning, mm -hmm. uh, and what would be the impact uh, if they were successful, and how difficult it would be then for the Obama administration uh, to reverse what they are right now still presently contemplating. Could you first lay out the danger, where are they in the regulatory system, and then what are the consequences if they are successful? Certainly, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, well, first, um, you know, over the course of this administration, they've had numerous attempts, uh, many caught, thankfully, by the, this, uh, by you and colleagues uh, up here, uh, an oversight capacity um, to undermine and um, uh, the Endangered Species Act administratively when they couldn't accomplish it legislatively. This big. Uh, issue go the, the the significant uh, issue underway now though is the change the unilateral change to the interagency consultation process which is the heart of the Endangered Species Act. By doing that, what they in essence have allowed are agencies to unilaterally decide whether or not their um, uh, activities uh, have effect. There's no check and balance. There's a reason for the different federal agencies, uh, and there's a reason that they uh, are aligned to follow different yet complementary missions. Uh, this interagency uh, Section 7 reg uh, cuts out the check and balance of the wildlife experts in either the Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fisheries Agent, uh, uh, Service, the two agencies set up, set up to protect species and habitat in this country. 
Um, uh, that's not to say that there aren't wildlife biologists and other agencies. There are, and they're quite competent, but they're often challenged by conflicting missions. Uh, uh, the Forest Service, the BLM, they have multiple use missions. Fish and Wildlife Service has a wildlife conservation mission. So by, by passing this sweeping change, um, uh, there, we will lose the ability to monitor the condition of species across the landscape because you'll have agencies unilaterally um, kind of checkerboarding impacts on species uh, themselves and there'll be no ability to evaluate a species condition across its range. Uh, that will affect all 1,400 listed species today and the many more ultimately that will deserve protection now as a result of uh, the, uh, implementation uh, of this reg if finalized. So I expect it will result in more species being put in jeopardy um, than less. It provides you know, an opportunity to cut corners. Um, the, the, the other um, issue it does is it um, allows the agencies to disregard certain effects, and that's how they get at global warming. Um, in their zeal to deregulate, if you will, all of the protections afforded the polar bear by finally listing it uh, a number of months ago through this 4D rule, um, uh, they, they, in essence, have excised global warming from consideration. And, and that's just unprecedented. I'm not here to say that this nation's um, uh, um, consideration of global warming and how to deal with the threats of global warming should be borne on the back of the Endangered Species Act. But I think it's ridiculous to take something as scientifically proven uh, as the impacts of global warming on species uh, um, and say disregard it under the Endangered Species Act. We didn't do it with invasive species. We didn't do it with timber harvesting. We didn't do it with the registration of pesticides. How can we unilaterally um, overturn the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's acknowledgement of the impact of, of global warming on species and say, oh, by the way, ESA, leave it alone. Um, that will occur if this regulation is passed. My time has expired. A uh, gentleman from Missouri, do you, have any, do you have any additional questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I sat in the uh, House last night and nervously um, awaited a vote, the final vote on a rescue package for the automobile manufacturers and I sat there uh, probably longer than anybody else trying to understand how we could put ideology ahead of uh, the best welfare of the country and I think everybody up here I, I really in my heart uh, would at least want to believe that everybody here is trying to do the best thing. I, I do get nervous when I hear that CO2 is not a pollutant. I mean, I listen to a debate on television, and I don't, I don't, I'm losing hair right here, so I don't have a lot to pull out. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to pull some hair out, because I couldn't believe that in 2008, people are arguing whether CO2 is a pollutant. I don't think there's any question about that. CO2 is a pollutant. That, are you suggesting it's a nice pollutant? I mean, uh, no, no, there, there's a difference between, air, sir, air, air quality has always meant the air that we breathe and it's effect Ambient on air. Us. Yeah, the, the, the air that we breathe, it's an effect on us. The question of whether ambient. CO2, am, ambient air, yeah, the, the air that we, I'm not suggesting that CO2 is not a pollutant or that it's not a problem. That, that was never my point and I'm okay, sorry I'm, if, I, well, if I misunderstood. Okay, yeah. I, well maybe I misunderstood. What, what were you saying? I was making a distinction between the, all of the other pollutants that have historically been regulated under the Clean Air Act in order to protect air quality, the air that we breathe. CO2, no, no one is claiming that by breathing CO2 we are doing any harm to ourselves. Yes. It's a very different kind of an issue, but it, it is, the Supreme Court has said is it, it is a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. Um, and and there's, a, there's a lot of kind of detailed legal issues there, but I, please don't misunderstand. I, 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 I think CO2 is an issue that we have to deal with, yes. Uh, 
I, I guess if someone wanted to measure where we are in, in this struggle, and I, I do, I mean, I, I, um, I had to do the funeral of Rainey Crawford uh, Jr. His, his father's probably watching this, and he, he, he runs out on the lawn in his underwear, uh, falls down uh, dead uh, of, uh, of an asthma attack. Um, and, and it is, it is you know, probably next to diabetes, uh, it is the most uh, dangerous, um, it has the most dangerous impact on, on African Americans. Uh, it's, it's so pervasive. I grew up um, about 300 yards uh, from what we called at the time the cesspool, uh, which was uh, the city's um, uh, treatment plant. And uh, I was about uh, another 200 yards, 500 yards uh, from the landfill uh, because they're historically, as you know, placed in minority communities. And uh, so I try to speak dispassionately in this committee, uh, but in my spirit, I'm screaming. I mean, I, I'm screaming. I, I know too many people who who, who are in cemeteries because of this, so, and, and that's not your fault. I, I just became very concerned over what I thought y you had said, but, but then I, I look at the fact that in eight years, the EPA administrator has testified before Congress, you know how many times? I, have, I don't know. Two. one of the most significant agencies. Sir, sir, that can't be right, because I've sat behind him in numerous hearings. I, I was at EPA, and I sat behind Mr. Governor Johnson? Oh, go, go, Mr. Johnson, I don't know, but the EPA administrator. I'm talking about Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson, OK. Yeah, I, I know I sat behind numerous hearings for EPA administrators. I, the, the, would the gentleman yield just briefly? Yes. Just for the record, the, the EPA administrator did not appear before uh, the House and Energy and Commerce Committee, which had the legislative jurisdiction over the EPA, for the first six years of the Bush administration. That is the committee with jurisdiction over it. Uh, so just for the record, it was the most successful witness protection program in the history <laughs> of the United States. Uh, Republican Congress, Republican Committee, Republican Agency, Republican President, the head of the EPA, that is the environmental minister of the United States. Uh, as the rest of the world's environmental ministers are looking for leadership, uh, is not asked to testify uh, before uh, the committee in the United States House of Representatives with jurisdiction over um, that agency. So uh, I would say that, uh, that uh, you know, when, uh, when Daniel Patrick Moynihan, if the gentleman would continue to yield, when Daniel Mat Patrick Moynihan used to say, uh, the way to avoid dealing with an issue is to engage in benign neglect. Don't do anything positive. Don't do anything negative. However, this was really a policy of designed neglect, hmm. you know, an actual policy of uh, designed to ensure uh, that these environmental uh, issues would not be uh, dealt with. And it required a Republican Congress and not calling the EPA administrator for six consecutive years uh, to testify before uh, the House of Representatives. So uh, I know that's a fact. Mr. Inslee and I sit on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, and for most of that time, if you put uh, the EPA administrator on a panel of two people, um, the uh, committee would have had a 50 percent chance of picking him out of a lineup of uh, two people. So uh, it was a very successful program. Uh, if, you, if you don't uh, know the name of the EPA administrator, people remember Mr. Ruckelhaus's name. People remember names of 30 years ago uh, better than they know the name of the EPA administrator today. It's just a fact of the matter. Uh, I apologize. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, the point I was trying to make you've already made quite, quite eloquently, which was that uh, um, the, the, the statement that this administration has done is I mean, we have done, uh, quote, as well as any other country in the world with environmental issues. And I, I think when we start trying to meet the lowest common denominator of success, we are falling like a rock uh, with regard to our leadership in the world. And I, 
I will just close out by asking you if you, I mean, if you, if you think that with the, the EPA not appearing before congressional committees is a sign that we are really uh, con uh, committed to um, uh, cleaning up this environment for unborn generations. I, you know, I've, I've certainly had the opportunity on a number of occasions to testify, and, and I appreciate your, your thoughtful questions. I, I, in my heart of heart, I believe that the best way to determine our commitment to the environment is, is to look at the state of our environment and to ask ourselves, is the air cleaner today than it was eight years ago? The answer is yes. I, I, I don't, the, the other measurements are harder to come by. It, there's no doubt that CO2 emissions have increased over the last, there's no doubt about that. But, but air quality as we measure the air we breathe is significantly cleaner. In CO2 we have a major challenge, a worldwide challenge, and, and, uh, and as I said, we're doing, no other country despite their rhetoric is doing better than we are when it comes to reducing CO2 because it's an enormous challenge. I, I agree. I, uh, it, if Mr. Kennedy was correct when he uh, uh, provided us with opening comments about the people who are now in positions of significance with regard to our environment, um, who are at least uh, uh, opposed to most of the, the things that we are, we are for, and I think the, the majority of the American public, I mean, is it like, you know, like putting a werewolf in charge of the the, the silver bullet uh, <laughs> store. I mean, is first of all, is are all of the people he, he mentioned? They're they're strong environmentalists. I mean, you would argue that they are strong environmentalists. What I can tell you, I mean, he he says some things about me that were not right. I'd, I'd never represented okay, well, a coal-fired power plant before I came okay, to let's, the Okay, let's eliminate but you. I, but I think what you have to do is look at people and what they've done. And are there people in the Obama administration who have worked for industries who will now have these positions? I think the answer is probably yes. But those are people who understand the issues, who truly want to do what's right for the country. and and. And I know that, that Mr. Kennedy has, you know, does, does not um, support some of the people, or maybe all the people in the Bush administration. Um, but I, I think you need to judge them by actually, you know, what what has been accomplished under their leadership. And, and I think that's the same way we should judge the Obama administration. I don't think, my view, we don't look at, you know, regulatory controversy or number of hearings, or we, we look at is the air cleaner is our, our, our emissions decreasing, is the water cleaner, is the land better protected? Th those are the kind of measures that I think we can all agree on, and I think we'll have a much more productive conversation if collectively we have, if we have that in mind, because I think that is kind of an ultimate goal that we can all agree on. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great, the gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Washington State. Here's what I would ask then in uh, conclusion. Uh, and that would be that each one of us, each one of you, give us your two-minute, your two-minute summary to us uh, as to what you think we should be thinking about over these uh, uh, final uh, uh, 35 or 40 days or so of the Bush administration in terms of this uh, midnight uh, regulatory uh, attack, uh, and uh, and the perspective you think not only this committee but the country should have. Uh, as uh, this uh, last-minute uh, review of regula regulations and attempts to remove them from the books or modify them are being engaged in by the Bush administration. We will begin with you, Mr. Homestead, reverse order of the way in which we began the hearing, uh, two minutes to each one of you. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to be here today. I, 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 I'm concerned that um, that, that we're not doing a good job of having constructive conversations about all of these issues. And I just urge this committee to look at the merits of each of these issues, to put aside the political rhetoric, and to say, in light of our shared goals to have a, a, a cleaner environment, um, is this the most effective way that we can do it? And I, you know, I'm not an ESA expert, but, but I do know that the ESA is, is not the way that 
that Congress intended to deal with climate change, and 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 I, I think it's not the way that can have any meaningful impact at all. And so let's let's talk about climate change and how we can deal with it. Um, and I think if we if we keep the conversation over the next 45 days and over the next four years at that level, we can all have a much more constructive conversation about climate change, which I know is of great interest to you and other members of the committee, about a more traditional clean air issues, about clean water issues, about all of these things. And I, I, I would, uh, my own hope is that, is that uh, some of the partisanship that has even been maybe in evidence here today can be put aside and that we can work constructively together on these issues. Thank you, Mr. Homestead. Uh, Mr. Walk. Uh, Chairman Markey and members of the committee, uh, first of all, thank you. I'm, I'm grateful and the country should be grateful to you for holding this hearing and shining an important light on this problem that all too often goes unnoticed in, inside the Beltway and in, in, in the broader country. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm in agreement with a, a Supreme Court Justice who once said that sunlight is the best disinfectant, and that is, that is starting here. But uh, let, let's, let's test the, the proposition of the administration's pride in in these matters. With these deeply controversial rules that we have discussed and others that we have not, let's invite the administration to share their internal documents and, uh, and professional staff and invite them to, uh, to discuss what they believe is uh, important. And let's take Mr. Holmstead at his word and discuss the content of these matters. Let's, let's have the staff and have the materials under discussion now be made available to the public and to this committee and to the Senate to, to examine. Uh, I dare say the administration would not cooperate because, uh, you know, let's, let's be serious here. These are deeply controversial pro-industry matters that they are trying to push out uh, no matter what spin the administration is trying to put on them. So I would encourage this committee to look ahead to the transition team and the incoming administration to sit down seriously to discuss ways to go back and reverse abuses that are being committed today and will be committed up until noon on January 20th uh, because the American people deserve no less. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walk. Uh, Ms. Rappaport-Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, you know, given the magnitude of challenges facing President-elect Obama and, and this Congress uh, uh, on the economy and foreign policy, I hope that through this oversight and, and continued diligence, we won't lose sight of the pressing effects of what this administration has done, the unprecedented attacks on, on um, key rules that govern how we steward our public lands, our endangered species, our air uh, and water. And we shouldn't play to the lowest common denominator. That's, that, that's just, uh, uh, just not acceptable. Um, I do think, however, w we need to be ever vigilant because when President-elect Obama takes office on January 20th, there will not be a light switch that just flips and all will be fine. Uh, we need to be aware and, and, and sensitive to how deep uh, the, the challenges are in these uh, federal agencies. Um, beyond just the political appointees packing up and going home, there are serious budgetary and administrative processes that have now um, embedded in these organizations, these agencies, that will need s significant and continuing oversight so that we can once again restore um, our stewardship responsibilities and obligations. I'm guided by my nine-year-old son, and he deserves what I have had over my time. And, and uh, the fact that our children and our grandchildren will not be able to enjoy these, this, this wonderful, uh, uh, natural, these wonderful natural resources um, should put us all to shame. And I look forward to working with you to, to right these wrongs. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rappaport-Clark. And uh, Mr. Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, I just, I, I, you know, I, I want to respond to one of the things that Mr. Homestead said because I think it's really important for this committee and for Congress to understand at every level, which is that um, I, cr criticizing the administration is not partisanship. I've been, I've been disciplined over 25 years as an environmental advocate about being nonpartisan and bipartisan in my approach to these issues. I don't think there's any such thing as Republican children or Democratic children. I think the worst thing that can happen to the environment is if it becomes the province of a single political party. But, if, um, but it's hard to talk about the environment in any context, honestly, today, without speaking 
about this administration and about what it has done to our environment over the past eight years. And if we don't understand the mechanisms by which this happened, and if we don't discuss those honestly, when we discuss them, it's not an attack on Republicans. It's just we have a responsibility to tell the truth, and if we see somebody doing something that is wicked, we need to talk about it, whether Republican or Democrat. I wrote a book about this administration. I would have written the exact same book if they were Democrats. It's a critical book, but it is not partisan. My father was absolutely against the partisanship because it's dishonest, ultimately. But I want to give you one example of what this administration has done. You know, Mr. Homestead said air quality has improved. This is, he has a very narrowly and carefully constructed worldview in which he is able to make these intricate, very narrow arguments. But in the real world, we're experiencing something very different, which is a decline in quality of life for all of the people of our country. Um, about eight years ago, the EPA announced that in 19 states, it is now unsafe to eat any freshwater fish caught in the state because of mercury contamination. The mercury is coming from those coal-burning power plants. In 49 states, at least some of the fish are unsafe to eat. In fact, the only fish state where all of the fish are safe to eat is Dick Cheney's home state of Wyoming, where the Republican-controlled legislature has refused to appropriate the money to test the fish. The, um, we know a lot about mercury now. The, uh, according to CDC, the mercury, there is one out of every six American women now has so much mercury in her womb that her children are at risk for a grim inventory of diseases, autism, blindness, mental retardation, heart, liver, and kidney disease. The, I have so much mercury in my body just from eating fish, two and a half times what EPA is considered safe. I was told by Dr. David Carpenter, who's the principal authority on mercury toxicity in this country, that if a, a woman with my levels of mercury in her blood would have children with cognitive impairment, with permanent brain neurological injury, Today, according to CDC, there are 640,000 children born in this country every year who've been exposed to dangerous levels of mercury in their mother's wombs. The Clinton administration, recognizing the gravity of this national health epidemic, reclassified mercury as a hazardous pollutant under the Clean Air Act. That triggered a requirement that all of those plants remove 90% of the mercury within three and a half years. It would have cost them less than 1% of plant revenues and we know that it works. When they stop emitting the mercury, it disappears within five years mostly from the fish and waterways downwind of those plants. But this is an industry that received 100, that donated $156 million to President Bush and his party since the 2000 election cycle. And they got, their reward was leaders like Mr. Homestead here, who came in and eviscerated that rule and instead replaced a rule that was written by utility industry lobbyists, his own law firm, Lathan and Watkins, which allowed, which, which, which ended the, essentially the regulation, that tight regulation of mercury, and allows these utilities to continue to discharge mercury at huge rates for endless periods of time. That's the cost of doing this, and this is why one of the important things, what Mr. Walk said, is to shine light on this situation. It's not partisanship, it's just honesty, and the American public is entitled to that. Uh, Mr. Homestead, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you would like to uh, say something. Yeah, I, I, I certainly agree that we need to be honest about all of these issues, and, and mercury is a, is, is a much more complicated issue, and I won't try to address it. I, I just would, uh, again, thank you for the chance to at least uh, share the, the, uh, the opportunity to be with others, and, and I'm hoping that Mr. Kennedy and I can maybe talk and, and uh, a little more civilly about these issues and, and, exp and, and we could maybe come to a, a better understanding of what really has and, and hasn't happened because I, I, I certainly respect his expertise in many areas, but on some of these Clean Air Act issues, um, I, I think we just need to sit down and talk them through. But thank you for giving me the chance to say something. Thank you, Mr. Homestead, very much. We thank each of you for appearing uh, with us uh, here today. Uh, there are 40 days left to go until uh, noon on January 20th. Uh, we are not going to turn out the lights in this hearing room. Uh, the staff is not going away. Uh, what we are going to do on a daily basis for the next 40 days is monitor everything that the Department of Interior is doing, uh, everything that OMB is doing, uh, everything that the Department of Energy is doing, uh, everything that the EPA is doing. Uh, we are going to be on their case. Uh, they should understand uh, that uh, if they make a decision uh, or they move towards making a decision, they will get a response from this committee. 
Uh, we are going to be there every single minute uh, so that the, the American people understand uh, what is being done by the Bush administration in these final days that could have a negative impact upon the environment. Uh, we uh, have no intention of uh, resting. Uh, if they plan on, on New Year's Eve to issue a new regulation thinking everyone will be preoccupied, we will be working. Uh, if they intend on doing it on Christmas Eve, uh, uh, and delivering lumps of coal uh, to the American people in new environmental regulations, we will be working on this committee. They should just understand we are not going to take off. Uh, it's unfortunate, but it has to be the way in which we expect the Bush administration to act uh, because that is the way in which they have acted for the last eight years. So we plan on uh, assuming that Regulations will be promulgated at the point in a day where they think the least amount of media attention will be paid to it. I hope that's not the case. We're being told it won't be, but I think just the attention that we are paying to these issues resulted in a decision yesterday to withdraw a couple of these uh, poorly uh, thought out uh, new regulatory actions by the Bush administration. There are many others right now being considered covertly inside of this administration uh, as going away presence uh, to industries. We don't intend on allowing it to happen without the full light of this uh, committee's attention being drawn to it. We thank each of you for your testimony here today. This hearing is adjourned.